Okay, so welcome to the last talk of this week. Next week, it's only going to be Raffaele. I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. So uh, without any further ado, let's uh, welcome Nick Rod, who's going to talk about the cosmic axiom background. Thanks, Michael. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming along today. Firstly, let me just thank the organizers for the uh, chance to come here today. It's just been fantastic. Uh, to be back in person and seeing everyone. I know I'm echoing some previous remarks of other speakers. Uh, particularly, I really enjoyed the conference last night. It was surprisingly romantic, but still very nice. Uh, so what I want to tell you about today is um, sort of an optimistic vision for what we might be able to do with the Axion Dark Matter program. I think there are many, many reasons to be excited about where the search for axions is going to go in the next 10 to 20 years. But maybe I just want to add a little epsilon for you today about why you might be even more excited about that. And that is because in a slightly optimistic, admittedly, scenario, we could actually discover something that these instruments weren't even designed to look for. And that is what we've dubbed here the cosmic axion background. So in particular today, really I just want to convey to you the possibility that this could even show up, but for many more details, please have a look in this paper that I wrote earlier this year in collaboration with Jeff Draw and Hitoshi Moriyama. Good, okay. I'm sorry, I don't... Thanks, Michael. Ah, thank you, excellent. Okay, so what I want to first remind you about is what is this progress that I was alluding to in terms of the search for Axion Dark Matter? Uh, where is it at the moment? Where do I hope it's going to be in the next 20, 10 to 20 years? Because it's going to be this progress that I want to sort of bootstrap off to look for something else. In particular, I think, I mean, realistically, the most mature searches we have for axion dark matter all proceed through this single Lagrangian term here, of course, the axion coupled to FF tilde. And famously, because this is a dimension five term, this coupling, which we don't know, but we know it has to be quite small, GA gamma gamma has to have inverse mass dimension that will come up shortly. So of course, famously, this Lagrangian term gives us two modifications, uh, three modifications, sorry, to Maxwell's equations. We have one modification to Gauss's law here, and then two modifications to the Ampere-Maxwell law. So note that they come in two qualitative flavors, however. Uh, we have these terms that are uh, come in with spatial gradients of the axion field, and then there's one that comes in with a time derivative. So if we're thinking about searches for non-relativistic dark matter axions, of course, these spatial gradients will pull out factors of the momentum, which will be down by a factor of V compared to um, uh, just the energy, which will be dominated by the mass. So normally when we're talking about axion dark matter searches, we focus just on this final expression here. And an analogy is drawn by comparing to this current, that in the presence of a magnetic field, the axion induces an oscillating effective current, which is what underlies many of the search techniques, some of which we've heard at this conference uh, already, uh, looking for uh, a non-zero value of this GA gamma gamma. Just one point I want to make in passing that unfortunately I won't get into today due to time, but uh, when you're talking about a relativistic axion, which the cosmic axion background will be, uh, these gradient terms cannot be neglected and actually they can give rise to new and interesting effects that we discuss in our paper. Okay, so when searching for this effective current, where are we at at the moment? Let me just lay out the landscape. And to draw your attention, what I'm really doing here is just pulling pieces from this fantastic resource um, uh, that Kieran O'Hare has put on GitHub, which is real up-to-date compilation of all the current constraints we have on Axion searches and actually many of the future projections. If you haven't seen this before, I thoroughly encourage you to have a look. So what I'm showing you on the landscape here is this unknown axion mass. And you can see we've got a couple of orders of magnitude here. This really uh, sort of sets the scene for why this is such a challenging problem. And also on the y-axis, I'm showing you the coupling to electromagnetism. And as noted, this has inverse mass dimension. So you can see that I've had to give some dimensions to this. So let's just look at the boundaries at the moment. Of course, uh, our, our, our situation is a little bit better than I'm alluding to on this plot. And so let me start putting some details in. So firstly, if we don't even assume that the axion is dark matter, if there just is this axion particle in the spectrum of states we know of in the universe, we can set the following uh, constraints. The idea is this particle, if it's light enough, it could be produced in compact objects like stars. And this could lead to a constraint in one of two ways. Either this emission of these relativistic axions uh, would give rise to a new cooling mechanism for these stars. And given our understanding of these objects, uh, we can set constraints on this. And so this is one set of bounds that come up here. 
Secondly, we can actually look for these relativistic axions directly. In particular, the famous example is the one where they're produced in the sun and we search for them in one of the LHC dipole magnets uh, as CERN in the case of the CAST experiment. In either case, the non-observation of these tells us that for light enough axions that they could be produced in these objects, uh, they have to have quite a small coupling to electromagnetism. So that rules out sort of large values of GA gamma gamma. So there is some, my understanding, this, these are constraints from Fermi, and there's actually a slight anomaly at the moment where um, uh, they are seeing higher energy uh, uh, gamma rays than you would expect. So famously at high energies, the um, extragalactic sky becomes opaque to gamma rays because essentially you can pair create off the CMB. Uh, but actually Fermi has seen more high energy gamma rays than they expect. And one way of interpreting this is that it could be uh, due to an oscillation of that photon into an axion and then back. And so I believe that this is what that, that window is at the moment, but um, there's a lot of debate around that. So that's a longer story. Good question though. So uh, what about up at these high ends here? Well, if we make the additional assumption that not only do we have an axion in the spectrum of our universe, but more than that, it's actually the dark matter, then through this coupling to um, electromagnetism, the axion can decay. In particular, it would decay to two photons, and we can just go out and look for anomalous photon lines in the universe. In particular, at these energies, we're often going to be looking at X-rays to search for this, and we're quite good at um, uh, X-ray searches, and that's not a very modest statement because this blue one here is actually due to my own result. Uh, and so what we were doing uh, in this particular search was we were looking for sterile neutrinos primarily, um, looking for them decaying to photons uh, in the X-ray band as well. But this is, can also be reinterpreted as a constraint on uh, axions, which is what is done here. But it just gives a flavor for the type of constraints we can have up at this end. So these, these basic um, uh, ideas, although there's a lot of work that has gone into them, sort of lays out the, the edges of the parameter space. GA gamma cannot be uh, too large, and the mass uh, also cannot be too large, otherwise you'd run into these constraints. But that still leaves an enormous amount of white space in the bottom left. Uh, and so, you know, optimistically, you'd want to cover as much as possible, but it's very useful to have some sort of theoretical prior if you're building an experiment to know which, which part of this parameter space should we be searching for. And indeed, such a theoretical prior is given by the fact that we don't want our axion, uh, our dark matter candidate to just solve that one problem. Ideally, we'd like it to solve two. And if the axion is also the QCD axion that strong, solves the strong CP problem, then we understand how it gets its mass through its coupling to QCD. And this induces, at least in the, the simplest UV models, a, a concrete prediction between, for a given mass, what the coupling should be to electromagnetism. Now there's some uncertainty in that. If you really think about the UV, there's a lot more than what's shown here, but that gives us a rough target that we should be looking to, to um, uh, search for axions with coupling somewhere along this orange band here. So let me tell you how we're doing at the moment for such searches. Uh, in particular, if we look at cases where the axion uh, mass corresponds to a Compton wavelength that can be resonantly matched to say a meter scale uh, instrument, uh, we're quite good at these types of searches and these resonant cavity haloscopes like ADMX or Haystack, you can see are already cutting into these orange bands. And actually the plot I'm showing here is not the most up-to-date result from ADMX. They had a recent update about two weeks ago. So there's, there's really ongoing progress here, but at the moment, no definitive sign of an axion. You might notice I've shown some, uh, some somewhat less, um, I mean, depending on it, at first instance, I would say, uh, exciting results uh, down here. You can see these results, for example, by Abracadabra, um, not only are they not getting beyond the star emission bounds yet, they've made the more aggressive assumption that this axion is dark matter. So in this sense, this might seem pessimistic. And the reason I'm showing this to you is again, not just because this is uh, related to my own work, actually what this is showing here is these are the first experimental realizations of ideas that you can search for axions at these lower masses, where essentially, generally a lot of these ideas are operating on looking for a resonant LC circuit type uh, instrument. And these ideas have been proposed in the last 10 years, but what we have now is prototypes showing that it's not completely nuts um, uh, to build these types of instruments. There's not much more background necessarily than have been theoretically predicted. And so these instruments are setting the stage for future instruments like dark matter radio that optimistically in 10 to 20 years will hit all of this blue parameter space I'm showing you here. So it's covering an enormous swath of the unexplored parameter space, and in particular covering um, uh, the, the prediction for the QCD axion over several orders of magnitude at this low end of the mass. Now, again, as I tried to allude at the start, this is a very incomplete description of what's happening in the, uh, the space of the search for uh, axion dark matter. In fact, if I'm being optimistic, my hope would be that within uh, 20 years, we would actually largely cover a lot of this uh, space all the way up to where these run into these star emission bounds. 
And so if the axion is the particle uh, that makes up dark matter, we could know the answer in uh, uh, 20 years. But also you can see generically- Sorry, which, which DM radio is that one? I mean, I thought that you guys had several proposals for different sizes, different cooling temperatures, and one was extremely futuristic, right? That's this one, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> so the, thank you for clarifying this. So you can see that there are the different yeah. shapes here. My understanding is that, um, so that there are more details in this letter of interest, but if I'm remembering correctly, the intermediate scale one will cover along here. And then if we go up to, I, I can't remember the exact name, it's like dark matter radio gut or something like this, uh, it, it will be down here. So, I mean, optimistically, no one has put a concrete timeline on this. I would hope that in the coming decades, we, we could reach this, but at least the, the proof of principle instruments have worked. So I think it's not completely impossible, but of course you need to remain somewhat optimistic, uh, which is a good spirit to take for the rest of the talk, because this is sort of how I'm going to be thinking about using this. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm also one of the optimistic No, I, I know, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, now there's a lot more that could be said about that, but yes, no, we're the future optimistic instruments looking here. But something I want to draw your attention to, if, if we do realize full reach, look how much um, wide space we are covering here. The improvements we have in these instruments is just obscene. It's going to be an enormous step forward in detecting extremely small amounts of power deposited in these instruments. So it's sort of motivated by this uh, is what the, the topic of the talk today is going to be. And that is to say, what if I had some other form of axions at the location of these uh, instruments? In particular, yes. Of course, yes. Um, so namely about the X-ray searches that you showed uh, for the higher masses. Yes. Um, I saw that there's of course lots of atomic physics lines that you cut out. So it seems that there's lots of holes in that parameter space that's being excluded there. So to what extent uh, could we also cover the region where there are uh, these lines? For instance, I assume that the atomic physics lines, there's typically correlations between a line here and a line there because one element emits at different frequencies. So to, to, to what extent could that be covered? So you're, you're talking about, um, uh, in particular, the lines that we've, we've masked out here. For I assume these are atomic physics lines and they are, they are a, an appreciable fraction of the parameter space, it seems. Yeah, so this, uh, I mean, it, exactly. A lot of what we're looking at here are background lines that we're not necessarily trusting. I mean, in principle, if we don't understand how they're distributed correctly, they could mock, out, mock up the signal we're searching for. And so we mask out those exact points of parameters. But space. you should still be able to set a limit there, even if it's an order of magnitude weaker or so. Yes, that, that's fair enough. But I mean, the, the, additionally, beyond that, you can also look like what we've done here is try and get as much data set as we can, which includes often looking through regions that we know emit in x-rays. So you can take, I mean, there's various ways you could, you could imagine approaching this. Either one, you obtain better modeling um, uh, for what you're doing there, and potentially then you can and, uh, push down uh, beyond the line that you know about. Or secondly, you can focus on observations, you know, as you get deeper telescope time in regions where the background you're worried about doesn't appear. Yeah. So I think we, we haven't tried to be as comprehensive as, as possible in this analysis and worry about no, every, every part of the detail, but I don't see a fundamental obstruction to, to removing those, those uh, lines there. Um, I mean, why, I mean, one other question just to, to bridge off is why is this only covering this small amount of region here? This is just because, I mean, I'm looking at an enormous range of masses here, and this is the full energy range of the XMM Newton telescope. So using other telescopes, you could hope to push this down um, uh, on either side of this mass range as well. All right, thanks for the clarification. Good, thanks for the question. Okay, so getting back into the optimistic mode, um, what I want to do is take this uh, 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 experimental reach that we're going to hopefully get and look for something that naively just seems it's going to deposit so little power, how could I ever hope to see it? And this is an example of uh, axions that are sort of produced like an analog of the cosmic microwave background, but then persist to the location of the Earth today. So just to say in passing, I mean, generally thinking about what you could do with these amazing instruments is something I've been doing a bit in my research recently. Just other, one other topic I'd love to talk about more offline but won't today is if we really take seriously the idea that dark matter is a wave, then we should be able to do a fundamental um, uh, analysis that we do on waves all the time, and that is interferometry. And so an idea explored recently is that you can literally perform interferometry on the axion wave if you uh, do detect it. This is the idea that you measure it at different spatial locations and combine the information from that. You can actually get more information out of that uh, than you would if you didn't perform this interferometry and also make pretty plots, which is what we're showing here. Okay, so back to the main theme. So what I want to do now is sort of set the scene similarly to how I did for axion dark matter, but instead for this uh, CAB, these relativistic axions that I'm describing. 
So let me just walk you through the landscape here, but also just to mention at the outset, we're trying to think about this in somewhat close analogy to the gravitational wave landscape. So there's going to be sort of a similar um, uh, layout to uh, the talk that Sebastian gave yesterday, if you, um, just to give some context for what I'm showing. So what I have on the x-axis here is no longer the axion mass. If I'm talking about relativistic axions, I just want the mass to be less than whatever energy I'm looking at. Uh, so instead, I'm showing the energy or equivalently the frequency of these relativistic axions. Now, I'm not just showing this over some arbitrary um, uh, range. I'm actually focusing on, in on the same frequencies that axion dark matter searches are looking for. So this is what I'm showing you here. For example, at the low end, these are the frequencies searched for by dark matter radio. In the middle, we have these resonant cavities. And at the top, there'll be instruments like Mad Max. And again, this is very incomplete. I'm just showing you a couple of these. And here, the, the vertical axis is, is meaningless. I'm just showing you the frequency range these are covering. So that's what I'm showing you on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I'm showing you what is the energy density in the CAB at that frequency. Uh, so this is defined again in analogy with gravitational waves, and it's just a measure of the energy density normalized to the critical density per log uh, frequency. Okay, so I mean, that's just a definition, but let me try and give you some intuition to what values of that energy density actually mean. In particular, if you had a CAB energy density comparable to the CMB energy density, you would be living somewhere around this gray dash line here. Now, of course, that can't be possible in the universe that we live in, otherwise we'd have a very um, a significant modification to cosmology. In particular, delta and effective measurements tell us we have to live below this. So then, staying optimistic, I've placed this um, uh, purple band here, and really you should label this as H0 preferred in uh, inverted commas, because all this is saying that some additional radiation very, very mildly alleviates the Hubble tension. I mean, if you interpret the, the value of H0 you've measured as an age of the universe, adding in non-zero delta and effective moves the central values away, but blows up the error bar. So technically it reduces the extent to which they're in disagreement. But more what I would think about this purple band is telling you is that if you have energy densities at around this value, not only should you potentially see something in the, the way I'm gonna tell you about today, but eventually we should also see something in cosmology. I mean, um, uh, at these sorts of levels, we do expect it to give some modification observable to cosmology. So we could check this in different ways. So having laid out what the axes are here and given you some intuition for what the values are, let me now put uh, real candidates for how you might produce a CAB in the early universe onto this plot. As the first example you would think about is the direct analog of the cosmic microwave background. Here you have axions that were originally in thermal contact with the standard model. At some temperatures they decoupled, you get a um, essentially just a black body distribution that then redshifts to today. So very similar to the CMB, you would generically expect this to end up at microwave frequencies or about 10 to the minus three, although the exact amount of energy density in this and where that is peaked will depend upon exactly when um, the axion decoupled, which we, we can't possibly know, but it gives us some target that we would expect energy densities around here. Oh, uh, sorry, what is due to entropy production? So. Yes, exactly, because the standard model then dumps additional entropy into the, so it's relative to the photon, exactly, that's right. Um, so this is, I mean, ideally, this would be what you'd want to search for, but just to tell you the answer straight away, this thermal case is not going to work with the type of um, uh, observation I'm going to mention today, although it's something that is quite interesting to think about, and I'll say some words about towards the end. So given how challenging this is going to be to search for, let's think about how else might we produce relativistic axions in the early universe. And there are potentially many different ways you could think about doing this. We just described a couple of these in our paper and we weren't at all trying to be comprehensive, but let me just share of those with you now. So firstly, let me bridge off something that we've heard a lot about uh, at the conference this week. And this is the idea that um, generically in theories where the axon is produced, depending on exactly when the symmetry is broken, especially if it's broken, well, in this case, if it is broken after the uh, end of inflation, you would generically expect to produce cosmic strings. These cosmic strings radiate axions. And in the case of axion dark matter, it's actually critical to understand this if we're gonna make a prediction for what the, the correct mass of the dark matter is. And we've heard a lot about this uh, this week uh, in Marco's talk, but also of course, I mean, as many of you might be aware, there's a, quite a bit of uh, discussion going on back and forth in literature as to what is the spectrum of axions emitted from these strings. So what I want to do is take this scenario and imagine, okay, instead of producing uh, dark matter axions, what if the same process happened for axions that weren't the dark matter? Then you would just get a, a distribution of these relativistic axions that again could redshift today. And generically you produce quite um, uh, 
uh, axions over a very broad range of frequencies. This is what I'm showing you in the inset plot here, which could easily cut into the plot that I'm showing you. Now, exactly what the spectrum looks like, this is what is under debate. But generically, my understanding is that even though the different groups uh, disagree on exactly what it should look like, they generically think it will be infrared dominated, which means that you would expect to get this broad spectrum over many uh, orders of magnitude. So having said that, let me now tell you, if we want to see something, where does this optimism come in? Well, we want to boost uh, the energy density as much as possible. And that means that we want to make FA as large as we possibly can, because the energy density in the strings is related to the tension, which goes as FA squared. So generically, in this scenario, we want FA to be of order 10 to, 10 to the 15, so that we can have energy densities approaching up around this um, uh, CMB energy density that I mentioned earlier on. So we have to be optimistic, but that's the, the framework in which I'm thinking. Additionally, there are other ways we can imagine making uh, relativistic axions in the early universe. It's been described a fair bit in the literature as the uh, concept of parametric resonance. So here the idea is, uh, say the axion is coupled to some other field. Uh, you could imagine uh, some simple U, uh, complex scalar where the radial mode is coupled to the axion. And then during inflation, we would expect the radial mode to be displaced from uh, the minimum of its potential. And then when it begins to oscillate, if the displacement is much larger than say the, the symmetry breaking scale, which was said it's naive mass, you essentially have a process where the, the effective mass of the particle varies as it moves around the potential. And so you have an oscillator with a varying mass. This is the same sort of setup as it's put on a swing as, it, uh, as they bob up and down. So you get the, uh, the varying moment of inertia. And although this may seem like child's play, actually calculating the spectrum that comes out of this is exceptionally complicated, but there's some understanding that it should roughly look like a Gaussian. So if we want to figure out what is the energy density in this case, well, we want as large uh, displacements during inflation, inflation as possible uh, in order to boost this up. But otherwise we have a fair bit of freedom as to exactly where this could peak. So we could imagine this could also peak again in our uh, experimental range. So these are the candidates that I'm going to be trying to think, can we search for experimentally today? But again, I don't think this is supposed to be comprehensive. I could imagine there could be other ways you could produce relativistic axions in the early universe. So with that said, what I want to turn to now is let's imagine such a background is there. How could we hope to discover it? And let me just make a very simple observation on this plot here. And that is that if we live to the left of this um, gray dotted line I've introduced, what we will have for these bosons is more than one per particle per de Broglie volume. And so as we move further to the left here, particularly down to these candidates I've shown you on the bottom left, we're going to have a very large occupation number of these states. And so this is when we can start to think of the axion as a classical wave, as we normally do in the, the, the case of dark matter. Why this is particularly helpful is that uh, we know we think often about these instruments in the language of classical waves. So it's not going to be a huge departure to thinking about how a relativistic wave could show up here as opposed to just this dark matter wave. Although there will be important differences I'll, I'll draw your attention to. That said, just to keep in mind, if we were looking at this thermal case, realistically thinking about this as a, a classical wave is not correct. We're really moving back from sort of the radio wave to the gamma ray way of thinking about light. And we should think about the CAB here as really individual axions flying around. Good, so now what I want to do is take this wave picture seriously and think carefully about what's going to be the differences between a relativistic classical wave and the non-relativistic classical wave, and how is that going to impact our searches for it at these instruments. So firstly, you can think about the axion as a large sum, because there's a macroscopic occupation number, of fields oscillating with some energy, and otherwise they're incoherent. There's just going to be a random phase. There's no reason to, to expect them to be coherent beyond um, potentially some common energy distribution. So what I'm showing you, though, is that for each particle, its energy is going to be drawn from some underlying distribution. So for example, that could be the various distributions I showed you on the previous slide, maybe the, the broad distribution for the string or a narrow distribution for the parametric resonance. Particularly, if we look at these distributions in the frequency domain, this is roughly how we would expect power to be um, uh, appear in our instruments if we looked at this, for example, the, the Fourier transform of any measurements we're making. And so in the, if I want to compare what you would see for dark matter, for a dark matter wave compared to the CAB wave, what you find is that if I put these on the same axes, I have to magnify enormously to see what's happening in the dark matter case. In particular, you can see, although I've got uh, units of nano EV on both uh, X axes, I've had to multiply uh, the frequency of the dark matter by a million so that you can actually see this finite width here. And the reason for this is because the dark matter is a non-relativistic particle, its uh, energy is dominantly set by its mass. 
And famously, the corrections to this are just a half mv squared, but because it's non-relativistic, these are very small. Uh, and so this is why we've had to for the no such um, uh, coherence enhancement that you get. And generically, you just have some order one width um, around whatever the central frequency is. One way of, of characterizing this, which will be helpful as I move forward towards detection, is to define an effective Q factor for these two uh, uh, types of waves. Uh, what the Q factor is, is sort of defined an analogy to resonant cavities, is it's just a measure of the inverse width of these distributions. Uh, the narrower the distribution, the larger the Q factor. In particular, I just define it as the mean value over the width of the distribution. And for dark matter, we know this should be enormous, around a million, whereas for the CAB, of course, it will vary from candidate to candidate, but it should be order one. And just a, a already from this, if you were actually able to resolve this wave in your instrument and you did like a, a Fourier domain analysis of what you're seeing, when you're searching for dark matter, you get a, essentially a delta function showing up in your instrument that you can search for. Whereas if the CAB is depositing power in your instrument, uh, it's going to be done so over a very broad range of frequencies. And so actually to tell you at the moment what ADMX and Haystack do is they take their initial data, smooth it, and then uh, remove that smooth component because they're looking for this, this very narrow line. So if the CAB was depositing any power in their instrument, they would have thrown that out at step one. Uh, but actually it is not super difficult to modify that analysis pipeline to account for this, although it is a, a challenging search to look for. And actually there's a lot more that could be said about that, but I, I won't do so today. Okay, so with that um, sort of intuition as to how the signal might show up, now let me turn to the question of, well, should we ever expect to see any power being deposited by the CAB? In order to do so, one calculation that is useful to start with is, well, how much power is even in the field? If I want to see something in my instruments, a good starting point is just calculate how much power is in the field. And one way to do this is to calculate something called the power spectral density, which just measures how much power there is at a given frequency in this field. It turns out on average, this is a statistical field, so we have to take the average, the power that we find depends upon the energy density in the field, unsurprisingly, and it also depends on how that uh, energy is distributed as a function of frequency. That's what P of omega is encoding here. Now, of course, though, we can't just measure the axion field directly. Otherwise, uh, this problem would have been solved already. Instead, actually, we only are able to access the axion through some small coupling and then also through derivative interactions because it's a pseudo Goldstone boson. So actually, the, our only hope of the power we could ever hope to access experimentally more accurately goes by this. We have to add in this g squared and also an additional omega squared. So in order to evaluate this um, uh, more simply, let me bring back this q factor I defined a few slides ago. And in particular, if I just evaluate this expression at the mean frequency, I can get rid of the, the probability distribution, uh, at least when, if I'm just making an approximation. And when I do so, what I end up introducing is this q factor here. And the way to understand this is that if I have a narrower distribution, uh, in order for the probability distribution to remain normalized, the amplitude has to get larger and larger. So all I'm saying here is that if I look at the mean frequency, for very narrow distributions, the power at that frequency must be much larger. This is why this Q factors come in. And then there's also a factor of omega bar that enters just for dimensional reasons. Good, so now I have some uh, rough estimate for what power there is at the mean frequency uh, in a generic axion field. And I can sub in specific values for the CAB or dark matter. What I want to do is use this to estimate how sensitive we should be for CAB power by saying, well, I know what uh, dark matter power these instruments are sensitive to. I mean, this is exactly what they're designed to look for. Either they've already set some limit on this power, or they have a forecast for what power they'll be sensitive to in the future. Just to get a simple estimate, I will say the CAB will be detectable, and I'll say some words about our caveats to this in a moment, if it deposits an equal amount of power to dark matter, just to get a rough estimate of where we should be. So that amounts to just evaluating this expression I have in the bottom left for these two cases. And if I do this just in a single frequency bin, I get the following expression here. So on the left-hand side, I have the dark matter factors, the, the known energy density of dark matter, uh, the Q factor, and then also whatever GA gamma gamma uh, that we either have set a limit on or we know we will in the future be sensitive to in the dark matter case. What I have on the right-hand side, however, is the values for the CAB. So it's got its, its different energy density and its different Q factor. But then note that I've set a different coupling on the right-hand side than I have on the left-hand side. In particular, the CAB isn't limited by whatever bounds we've set, assuming that the axion is dark matter, because it doesn't require the axion to be dark matter. Instead, the only limit we have on this is that it has to live below these star emission bounds I told you earlier on. 
So with a view to being as optimistic as possible, let's imagine that this coupling is right up near these star emission bounds. But in the spirit of being as honest as possible, this is not a generic expectation. Uh, in particular, for example, in these string emission mechanisms I said earlier, you want as large a FA as possible to get the maximal energy density, but in, naively that uh, uh, pushes your GA gamma gamma, uh, GA gamma gamma down. So generically, you'd want some model building in order to boost this, um, uh, this photon coupling, but there are mechanisms in the literature for doing so. Good, so then if I imagine that that is where the coupling is, I can interpret this as a limit on uh, the energy density. And actually, you'll see that I haven't just rearranged this expression here. What I've done to arrive at this result is to say, well, okay, in any, uh, in the central bin, dark matter will win because that's, it has an enormous distribution there and that's where all its power is peaked. But it's, you shouldn't just look in that central bin because the CAB is deposited over many of these. So the idea is that you should take the information across all the bins the CAB is deposited in. And ultimately, when you combine this, you don't get as hard a suppression in the Q factor as you might have thought. But let me just look at this result for a moment and tell you where we're losing and where we can hope to win. So fundamentally, as I told you earlier on, the CAB energy density must be below the CMB energy density. That means it's at least nine orders of magnitude smaller than dark matter. Secondly, the signal is much less coherent, which is what is encoded in this Q factor suppression, and that's an additional factor of a thousand we lose. So fundamentally, the signal, I mean, if they had equal couplings, would deposit at most uh, a trillionth of the power of dark matter. But the fact is that these instruments uh, in the future are going to get so unbelievably sensitive that you can overcome this, uh, this suppression and actually actually see something as I'll show you in a moment. So just to say, this is a very rough estimate of what the sensitivity is to the CAB. What we actually did in our paper was calculate, uh, working through carefully how uh, uh, the signal would show up in either a broadband or, or a resonant uh, instrument. And we found that this parametric scaling is confirmed up to some order, order one factor in both cases. Good, so armed with this expression, what I can do now is go back to the landscape. And in this optimistic scenario where I imagine that the coupling is near uh, these star emission bounds, I can just put either existing limits or future projections straight onto this plot. And this is what I've done here. I'm showing you the existing instruments in the solid curves, and I'm showing you future instruments in the dash curve. Of course, and especially given what Raphael said earlier, you should not interpret these uh, as equivalent um, experimental searches. Let me just make some pretty obvious statements based upon what you can see here already. And that is that existing instruments cannot reach down to this, this cosmic uh, uh, background, even if we're being as optimistic as possible. However, in the future, instruments like dark matter radio certainly will cut into this. Um, and so if, uh, especially if we start to see deviations in cosmology, or maybe if future instruments like IAXO actually see something, then it could be very well motivated to look for um, uh, a cosmic axion background signal in an instrument like dark matter radio. Let me, having said that, just tell you some of the, the questions that I think this plot raises for me. And as, as I alluded earlier, uh, you can see that this thermal case is nowhere near even future projections uh, for, for dark matter searches. What this tells me is that if I want to discover a genuine uh, uh, analog of the cosmic microwave background made of axions, I'm not going to be able to do it by reinterpreting uh, in data that was uh, collected in the search for dark matter. But fundamentally, that shouldn't be too surprising. These dark matter instruments are designed to look for waves. And as I said to you earlier, the thermal CAB just does not operate like this. So you, sh you shouldn't be surprised that you can't just reprocess the data collected by those instruments to search for this. However, you can ask the question of, could you um, uh, potentially design an instrument that optimistically might be able to see this? And I, I've done some simple estimates that say yes, but I mean, realistically figuring out if this is possible is quite a complicated question and, and something I'm thinking about in a bit more detail now. So possible, but uh, not yet determined. Secondly, what I've done today is just focus on the most um, uh, developed, in some sense, searches for axion dark matter, and that is through its coupling to photons. But as we know, there are many other searches for the axon through its other couplings, and in particular, searches like Casper Wind uh, are able to probe uh, axion uh, masses down to much lower frequencies. Uh, and because of this, this general scaling continues, actually, I believe that Casper Wind will be a much more sensitive is instrument to these types of scenarios uh, than what I'm showing you here. Finally, though, fundamentally, it is an obstruction. If you want this thing to be a, a relic of the early universe, not being able to uh, have energy densities larger than the CMB energy density is a challenge. 
And so a question you can ask is, is there any way we could produce relativistic axions in the light universe? And I think this is an answer that is an a question that's interesting to explore. Uh, there's been some discussion of this in the literature, but one idea I'm trying to flesh out at the moment is could you potentially have dark matter decaying into relativistic axions that you could then go and search for? Now, naively, this might seem like it works. You would get something like I'm showing you here that could easily outproduce the CMB energy density while remaining consistent with other constraints, and you might see this. But actually, there's some quite subtle aspects of Bose enhancement that enter into this problem that we haven't fully worked out yet um, that would modify this. And, and whether there is a, a version of this scenario you can realize is something I'm currently trying to understand. Okay, so with that said, let me uh, wrap up. And again, just to go back to this, you know, optimal. Uh, good. So what will happen here is that for any energy density you want, that which will be a CMB energy density, you would find that the dark matter will rapidly deplete itself. And what you will happen is uh, essentially the, dark, the back reaction becomes important. So what's going to happen is dark matter sloshes into axion and back and forward. And I think the sort of interesting energy density you have here. But there are, I mean, there are some ideas I'm thinking about at the moment is you can model build around and have some scenario where you can still get an interesting signal, but maybe not be. I mean, I think that scenario is completely ruled out as potentially being dark matter, for example. So, yeah, I mean, it's literally just stimulated emission, but actually working that through and finding if there's some parameter space where, I mean, that effect is always there, but whether you can actually realize a signal at these instruments is not as simple as just saying dark matter decay to axion. Yeah. Right, but to sum up, just going back to the, the, um, the vision at the outset, I mean, in the next 10 to 20 years, if we're as optimistic as possible, we may discover the uh, uh, dark matter of our universe. And if we're even more optimistic, not only that, we might, may find other axions in the form of uh, uh, the relativistic CAB, uh, as I've tried to convince you of today. Okay, thanks for your attention. Actually, I have a question. So... Is there any hope of, uh, of seeing the anisotropic part of this background? So, I mean, this is, there are two reasons why this is challenging. Um, the first of which is, as we know, in the case of the CMB, um, the perturbations are it's small. small. Yeah. So seeing this is already very challenging. Um, so to see that and then break uh, actually down into the, um, uh, the, those anisotropies, it would be very challenging. But I mean, it would be very interesting if we're able to do this, but I think, Maybe even my optimism is topping out at that point. But I, just to say there's a second challenge here, and that is that like instruments have no measure of the incident direction of the field. So actually, if all they're measuring is the energy uh, that, that is stored in this, which doesn't keep, I mean, it's a scalar, so it doesn't keep track of which direction the, the field is coming in. So if you actually want to, well, this is for the instruments I've told you about here, that, that doesn't apply for Casper Wind. But if, if one of these instruments is, discovers the CAB and you actually want to get some information about how that's distributed on the sky, you have to have, use additional techniques to get this out. Actually, this interferometry that I mentioned can get that uh, additional information out that's hidden from this. But again, you're not just getting it as easily as you do for photons. So uh, I think actually pinning down very detailed structure on the sky would be even more challenging than just uh, what you would naively think is the case for the CMP. I mean, it's an exciting question to think about, but I'm very, very optimistic. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, want to say something about the cosmic, uh, ju uh, just to correct uh, the statement. So most of the collaborations don't, don't agree that uh, the spectrum is IR dominated. There's only one collaboration that says that the spectrum is IR dominated, which is us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the others say that instead of uh, it's either Q equal to one or smaller than one. And uh, if it's Q equal to one, then unfortunately, uh, the spectrum is not, actually not, not scaling via like that. Most of the energy is, is in UV axions, which uh, essentially makes the the plot a bit a bit le le less good, good looking. But in particular, is in uh, IR axions is kind of not uh, not no. there. Uh, but uh, I'm kind of sure that Q is larger than one, so that's not uh, that, that's more. Uh, 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 Joe, what uh, uh, was asked, what, what is the, the, the value of GA gamma gamma SC you, you, you used? Uh, just the cast bound. Which, which is uh, 10 to the minus 10. Uh, uh, 6.6. 6 uh, uh, what, what changes if you, you know, if you change it a factor of 10? Like, is oh, the, are these prospects change a lot? 
Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not hard to understand. I mean, I, I come back to uh, comment on your first point originally, but just to answer this one quickly, we know that the power goes as row A, G A gamma gamma. Okay, so, so if you change a, a, a GA factor... gamma by that, you pay two um, orders of magnitude okay. in um, this year. And so, I mean, just to be honest, if it turns, if I nothing, this scenario becomes much, much harder to see. But I mean, it's not particularly surprising. In order to see something like this, we need a, a, an axion in our spectrum that is quite as, as uh, strongly coupled to electromagnetism as we can make it. If Iaxo sees nothing, we already have a very good uh, uh, hint that this is not a particle that exists in our universe. Uh, however, we could be optimistic and say maybe Iaxo does see something. I mean, this is why we're building the instrument. And if it does, I think these searches will be even further motivated. Okay, what's the coupling you, you used to, to break the thermal, thermal part? The same coupling or? Oh, because um, it, it depends on the temp temperature of the coupling. I mean, and it's not a very, this, this thermal background doesn't necessarily just have to be produced through coupling to the photon. Okay. Right? It could be through other couplings that we end with this energy density, but then what is going to be detectable in the way I've set this up here is it's coupling to the photon. So okay. it's, it's not just uniquely determined by um, the coupling to the photon. However, you can ask, if I had a coupling to the photon at the, the cast energy density, uh, I sorry, at the cast limit, what energy density or what decoupling temperature is another way of phrasing this, would I end up having? And it turns out it's about a TeV. So which okay. is one of the plots I showed okay. earlier. So also what the, the value of a phase you used to, to get the cosmic string, like the numerous. It's like 10 to the 15. I was showing this earlier. Yeah. That, that's also bounded by uh, that an effect, which I think yes, you... no, of course, yes, yes. That's, that's also, by, by the way, for the same for the same value of a phase, the gradation waves emitted are, are visible. So if you want this kind of a complementary signal, of, fantastic, uh, yeah, yeah, of, <laughs> of the background. Yeah, yeah, just to go to your first point about the IR dominated. Uh, so I mean, of course, you're the expert on this. I appreciate that that correction. But my understanding, and I checked this, but maybe there was an issue, so I'd have to look again. That even at Q equals one, we were still seeing a signal here. No, we should double check. This. No, no. No. Okay. So, yeah. No, no. If you if one, the spectrum is more more UV. If Q is more than one, all the, all, 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 all the energies emitted at, at, at the scale of, of, of a phase, which is super 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 UV. If Q is equal to one, it's a, a bit more UV. If, if instead the uh, Q large and one scale invariant plus these logarithmic violations. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't fully understand that in the sense that if it was UV dominated, uh, then these groups who are saying Q equals one, I would naively think that they would say the strings don't contribute significantly, no. but they are saying that. So. I know you can just do the integral and you see that. It's... Sure, which is anyway, I, I'll have to check this, but I, I did that and I did not find what you're saying, but I should check. Okay, anyway, uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you for. Thanks for the comment. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Well, I, I have a few questions, but if there is anyone else, I will leave them the precedence. Well, one is, uh, well, you said that you did these estimates both for resonant and broadband setups. I mean, is my naive intuition that broadband should win through or I mean, just because this doesn't look like a resonant signal? And, and yeah, so this, I have to admit, when I, before I did the calculation, that was my expectation too. So just to tell you about why, um, uh, as, like the, the, the statement, uh, how this works in both cases, but the statement that this signal is less uh, coherent in the time domain corresponds to the, the statement that in the frequency domain is just broader. This is what we saw. But this means that for an equivalent amount of power deposited in a broadband instrument, you have to contend with more background because the background is distributed across frequencies. And this actually means that the, the Q factor uh, difference or the coherence difference between the dark matter and the, um, uh, the broader CAB case must enter. And so it ends up entering like the square root here. How does this operate? However, for the resonant uh, instrument, you essentially imagine that you're doing a different search in each frequency bin that is enhanced by the bandwidth of the, the cavity. Uh, and when you add each of these, if you add the, that information incoherently, you still pay a penalty um, that ends up uh, scaling like a square root. Now, the order one numerical factor that I haven't shown here does differ between the two cases, and we work that out, but the parametric scaling does not. Thank you. Because I would have expected somehow that there was some uh, like right number of bins to sum, right? I mean, in some region, the signal that you're pulling into your like, window should increase. Uh, with respect to the background when you enlarge it, and then at some point you should stop, right? Well, maybe, maybe. Yeah. 
No, no, no. I, I mean, one aspect to which um, I think you're certainly correct, and I, I'm being a little bit, um, uh, you know, quick here in, in what I'm stating, is the fact that you could imagine that the, the power that is in your, um, uh, for example, particularly these cosmic string scenarios, it's over an extremely broad range. And if you're just thinking about a resonant cavity, if we look at the, the reach, for example, that ADMX has achieved at the moment, it is not that broad. So ultimately, just the fact that you're only going to hit a finite range of frequencies, you will eventually win, uh, potentially from the broadband perspective, because you see more, but for a given frequency range, the scaling between the two is the same for the reasons I just mentioned. Yeah. No, thank you. More thinking about our heterodyne stuff that in principle, when it's roadmap can cover like, I don't know, 10 orders of magnitude, not, not so much. But okay, uh, the other question I had was, um, what happens to that cosmic strings line if you keep going to lower frequencies? Ah, good. Um, so and just, just let me say one final comment on this, this point here. I, I generally agree with your statement on broadband, but I think the landscape we live in at the moment is that most uh, axion instruments are proceeding in the, the resonant regime. So that is generally how I think about this. But yeah, it's a fair point. Oh, no, I didn't want to disagree. I was no, 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 I, I appreciate that. Yes, yes. Um, just to say the cosmic strings, because I showed this earlier, you can see it, here I'm going down to 10 to the minus 25. So you can see it goes to much, much lower frequencies in principle. So. And I didn't describe this, um, uh, what we're doing uh, between these two cases here is as we heard in Marco's talk, it takes some time after the symmetry breaking scale for the strings to enter the scaling regime in principle. Uh, and while I know how to calculate the spectrum once I'm in the scaling regime, I'm, I'm a bit unsure as to how to do that uh, here. So what I'm showing is if I just imagine they're instantly in the scaling regime, I get the, the solid curve. Whereas if I just ignore any emission and wait three orders of magnitude and assume they enter the scaling regime, then I get this dotted curve here. And actually that's what I've taken uh, in the case here, which is a bit conservative, but we haven't implemented. I imagine potentially with simulations, you could bracket that at some level, but we just did a simplistic treatment here. Yeah. You, you, could also, you, you could also generate these, uh, these actions from, from uh, free transitions. So when this particular free transition happens, you emit lots of stuff, you create strings, but also you can create uh, axions, relativistic axions. I don't worry, they, they get uh, they should, they should a lot, but if you make some tricks, maybe. I think that's right, but my. Do you, do you, do you try to check? Given, yeah, we did think about this, but given that the temperature is at the scale of the symmetry breaking, the interactions are large at that point, and I would think that those would just thermalize. So I think the axons emitted oh. at that time would end up contributing to the thermal um, uh, contribution there. But it's a, it's a very good okay. point. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, if not, thank Nick again.